pleased to welcome Chris Helzer. Chris Helzer is the Nature Conservancy's Director of Science in Nebraska. His main role is to evaluate and capture lessons from the Conservancy's land management and restoration work and share those lessons with other land managers. He also works to raise awareness about the value of prairies and prairie conservation through photography, writing, and presentations. Chris spends a lot of time photographing prairies and their inhabitants. His photos can be frequently seen uh, in publications and on websites of the Nature Conservancy, as well as magazines like Nebraska Land Magazine and Wildflower Magazine. Chris is also the author of two books published by the University of Iowa Press, The Ecology of and Management of Prairies in the Central United States, and Hidden Prairie, Photographing Life in One Square Meter. Chris lives in Aurora, Nebraska, a beautiful small town right on the edge of tall grass and mixed grass prairie. Uh, and so with, with no further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Chris. All right. Thanks, Wes. Yeah, I appreciate the chance to talk today. Um, I also see some people in the participant list that I know. So thank you for, for joining, even some TNC colleagues, it looks like. So uh, feel, <laughs> feel free to issue corrections during or after the talk, I guess. I want to talk today about um, prairies and resilience. And I'm going to apologize up front for my voice because I was telling Wes ahead of time that I just got done with a couple of days of burning. The uh, the picture you see behind me is from the, the last couple of days. <clears throat> Excuse me, so I'm feeling a little smoky in my lungs at the moment. Hopefully I'll get through it. But I want to start in the obvious place, which is sunflowers. And when we talk about resilience, I like talking about sunflowers because in Nebraska, we have nine different species of native sunflowers. I think Minnesota has 10, but that was based on a very quick internet search, so I could be wrong. Um, in Nebraska, you know, we have a couple of, of annuals. The rest of those are, are perennial sunflower species. There's also a lot of other flowers that look like sunflowers and provide a lot of the same kinds of resources that sunflowers do, which is important because there are a lot of species that depend on them. So here's a bee, for example, that is a, a sunflower specialist. It's one of the longhorn bees that feeds primarily on, um, or maybe solely on sunflower uh, species. And then there are a lot of other insects that, that feed on the pollen and nectar in sunflowers, partly because sunflowers do a really nice thing, which is they, they literally put the food on the platter, right? So you have this big dish with a lot of pollen and nectar right in the middle of it. It's easy to access. It's not one of those tricky flowers like a pea flower where you have to figure out how to squeeze into the flower to get the resources. It's just right there sitting there. So it's really accessible for a lot of species, which also brings in predators. So just like a, a, a crocodile at a watering hole in Africa, you've got predators that are waiting there where they know creatures are gonna come to feed. So whether it's a crab spider or an assassin bug, it's important resources for them too. And then uh, things like ants are attracted to sunflowers because sunflowers do an additional thing, which is they produce extra floral nectar. So those little glistening droplets you see here on the back of the bracts of that sunflower, that's an extra floral nectar that it attracts ants because ants have a sweet tooth, but ants are also a predator. So there may be an advantage to the sunflower to have ants swarming around on it, um, kind of buying protection a little bit, although it clearly isn't working in this case because uh, that sunflower is pretty chewed up. And then because there are a lot of ants there, uh, crab spiders are waiting to take advantage of those too. Sunflowers also produce a lot of really big and nutritious seeds for wildlife, which is why we use them in bird feeders. So if you have a bird feeder and you put sunflower seeds in, uh, you know how well that works in terms of attracting animals because it's a really good package of food. And then even grazers like cattle or bison uh, will use sunflowers at different stages. Uh, a lot of times, right as they're starting to bloom is a great time because they get that, that same nutrition packet that a, that a wildlife species might use for the seeds, but they get it kind of while it's still young and tender. The other thing about sunflowers though that makes them really helpful, or another thing, is that it's a species or it's a group of species that can respond really well after droughts, especially the annuals. So, this is a photo from our Niobrara Valley Preserve in north central Nebraska in the Sand Hills of Nebraska. And this was taken in late July 2012, which was at the end of, or the sort of toward the end of the worst uh, single year drought in recorded history in that part of the world. And then right after a massive wildfire that had gone through. So a combination of drought and wildfire and the entire 12 million acres of sand hills outside of our preserve the next year, as well as on our preserve, looked like this a year later. It was just loaded with annual sunflowers across that entire kind of drought stricken area, but especially in the places that had burned. 
And it was an incredible resource because a lot of other plant species were under stress uh, because of the drought and the wildfire. And those sunflowers are kind of able to fill in that gap and provide something for a lot of animals to eat, provide habitat structure, all sorts of things when other species were not available. And we've, we can replicate that with our management. So here's the same site, not exactly the same site, but the same area of our preserve uh, in a year that we burned with a prescribed fire in the spring. Bison hit it really hard all summer. This is another July photo. You can see the grasses are really suppressed. Um, Although interesting things like you know lead plant in the foreground are doing fine. But uh, a year after this, or actually later in the same year, we get the same kind of sunflower response. So when the, when the dominant vegetation is weakened, those annual sunflowers jump in and kind of fill the space. So sunflowers do a lot for us. And the other thing about sunflowers is because there are a lot of different species, and this is the important part, <clears throat> they sort of array themselves across these gradients of habitats so that no matter where you go, at least in Nebraska, if you're in a natural area of some kind, there's a good chance you're gonna see a sunflower species or two. And that's a helpful thing in terms of thinking about climate change because as the climate continues to change and these habitat conditions change, it's likely that one sunflower will replace another one or shift into another one's range, but we'll always have a sunflower in these different ha habitat types, which is part of the resilience we're gonna talk about all day here. So I want to switch quickly to milkweeds and talk about something similar there with milkweed species. In Nebraska, we have 17 species of milkweed, not all of them big and pink. Uh, I think, again, quick internet search, I think Minnesota might have 14 species, but similar diversity. Uh, and they're really valuable for uh, lots of different pollinators, whether that's bees or butterflies or flies or wasps. Uh, they provide a lot of resources. They have a fantastic pollination strategy that I'm not going to talk about because I don't have time, but uh, if you're interested, look it up. Look up how, how milkweeds get pollinated because it's not what you think unless you have studied it. But then they also attract predators just like the sunflowers do that are waiting in the wings. Look at the camouflage, by the way, of that crab spider on that spider milkweed. Um, and then because milkweed has that white sticky latex, which is toxic, there are some insect species that have specialized on feeding on the milkweed leaves and stems because they felt they figured out how to evolutionarily figured out how to deal with that latex, whether they eat around it or they just figure out how to process it without being poisoned by it. So longhorn milkweed beetles are an example of that. Um, large milkweed bugs, another example of that. There's a whole community of insects that sort of comes around this one group of plants. Um, these are oleander aphids, which are a non-native aphid, but it's still a species that can deal with that toxic latex. And then of course monarch butterflies are the one that everybody knows about, right? And monarchs will use a lot of those different species, probably all of those different species, although they have their favorites. But the value of having, in our case, 17 different milkweed species, if you look just at monarchs, there was a, or we got a really cool example several years ago why multiple species of milkweeds is important. So I wanted to quick share that. We, in Nebraska, we normally don't see monarchs until May, uh, maybe mid-May, and we get the second generation out of Mexico, which I think is the same generation that comes to Minnesota when you see, first see them. So the ones that leave here in the fall go to Mexico, they overwinter in Mexico, they come back into the United States and they get as far as say like Arkansas, right? They come into the Southern US and they lay eggs there. The next generation that hatches then from those eggs are the ones that we normally get in Nebraska. But I think it was 2017, uh, we actually got the, 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 the Mexico generation, a lot of them came all the way up to Nebraska for some reason, and they got here in like mid-April, which is super early, and there wasn't a lot for them to eat. And you can see by the condition of this monarch, it's had a long life and a, and a stressful life. It's got not, not much color left in its wings. Um, and so it was feeding on things like dandelions because that's what was here. And then it was trying to figure out where to lay eggs. And the problem was that its favorite milkweed species, the big ones like common and showy milkweed were, had frozen off if they had even come out of the ground. So they weren't available. There were no common and showy milkweeds available. But fortunately there was world milkweed, which this is what it looks like when it blooms. It's not what it looked like at the time, but it was up out of the ground. It was six, eight, six to eight inches tall. It survived that same freeze that killed off the other milkweed species. And because of that, it became available for monarchs to use. And so this is a, a, an egg and a caterpillar, and the caterpillar has a little parasite uh, egg laid on it. So there's a whole cycle of things happening here. 
because world milkweed was able to fill in the role that normally is taken up more by other milkweed species. And so because of that, we raised a nice generation of monarch butterflies, even though it was an odd year. And uh, this is the, the system kind of did its job there. So it's another example of species diversity, building resilience. It's, a, it's kind of a cool story. So the last example I want to talk about is just pollinators in general. And I'll start with honeybees only because people pay me way too much attention to honeybees and I just I like draw, drawing attention to that. Um, so honeybees are a livestock species that we brought in from Europe uh, back in the 1600s. They've established some feral populations, but most of the honeybees we see are the, the, the captive managed animals that, that we use for agricultural production. Um, they are important pollinators for a lot of things, but they also compete with our native pollinators and they only pollinate themselves a fairly small fraction of the native wildflowers that we have out there. So a lot of the rest of that work is done by our native community, which includes things like bumblebees. And, you know, in Nebraska, we have 20 different kinds of bumblebees. Uh, and then, you know, it's hard to know because we don't have great inventory data, but between four and 500 probably different bee species just in our state and, you know, between four and 5,000 in North America, there's a lot of different kinds of bees out there that people don't mostly pay attention to because when people talk about bees, everybody sort of visualizes honeybees within the general public, which is a shame because that's not uh, where most of our pollination work is happening. So native bees come in all different sh shapes and sizes and colors, um, and they all play their roles a little bit differently. A lot of them are ground nesters, uh, and a lot of them are solitary. So this is the, the, the nest of a bee that is a single mom she, she digs this hole herself, she lays her eggs down in there, she goes out and gets pollen and nectar, mixes it together, sets it next to the egg, seals up the egg and the food in a cell, and then stacks those on top of each other within this cylinder in, inside that tunnel. Other bees that nest in hollow stems basically do the same thing. And the, the vast majority of the bees doing this are solitary bees, meaning that they are a single mom working by herself on a nest. There's no queen, there's no workers, there's no support system. If she leaves the nest, she has to hope that nothing gets in there and eats everything while she's gone. And when she's there, she has to defend that against all comers. Um, here's an example of a solitary digger bee who is also a specialist um, in terms of what she feeds on, or this one is a male, I guess. This is a blue sage bee, which has the, maybe the most amazing blue eyes I've seen in a bee. And it matches the color of the flower that it specializes on. So the blue sage bee feeds on nothing else other than blue sage or pitcher sage. Uh, salvia, if you know that. And it's just an example of something that's very specialized on one end, but then on the other end, there are lots of bees that are more generalist, including things like bumblebees. The reason I bring all of this up, though, is that there's another example of this diversity and resilience connection where with bees, just, just thinking about bees, not even all the other pollinators, but just thinking about bees, there's this wide diversity of bee species that each play their own role some of them need a certain kind of flower because it's the species that they feed on. Some of them can only access a type of flower because they have a certain tongue length uh, or they're, they're too big or too small to access the resources and different flowers. So because of that, the bee community needs a large diversity of flower types and flower species. So flower diversity really influences the success of the bee community. And at the same time, that diversity of bees influences the flower community because a flower in most cases is gonna need um, you know, consistent pollination. And that's going to happen only if there are a lot of different kinds of bees out there, because not all bees are going to have a good year every year. So if you have a bee that's not around because the habitat's changed or there, there's a disease issue or whatever, there's a good likelihood that there are several other bee species, at least, that'll do the same job in terms of pollinating that flower species. So those, the diversity of bees, diversity of flowers tie together, and it makes a, a very resilient ecosystem um, for that, for that sort of network. All right, shifting gears slightly, um, let's talk about disturbances because disturbances are what drive prairies. Prairies exist because of disturbances and those disturbances, the, the three big ones are fire, grout, drought, and grazing. And they interact with each other, right? So if you have a drought, you're more likely to have fire and you're more likely to have intense fires. So you have more frequent, more intense fires if you have a drought. Um, if you have fires, you're gonna draw in large grazers like bison or today cattle. Uh, because they're attracted to the regrowth after a fire. But then when they come in and they graze that area, that actually fireproofs it because there's no grass left to burn. So there's a tight relationship there both ways. 
And then drought, of course, influences grazing animals because if it's really dry, there's less to eat and that changes the way that they work across the landscape. So these are really important and also very interconnected disturbances. And then let's talk about the way all of us probably learned about how ecosystems work in high school, which is ecological succession, this very linear process, right? From bare ground to old growth forest at the top. Um, and if you don't have disturbances, these, the ecosystem would progress along that line. If you do have disturbances, it goes backwards until the disturbance ends and then it starts going forward again. And where it gets complicated is when you talk about something like a prairie, because a prairie is sort of an intermediate disturbance community if you look at ecological succession, meaning that it's not, it's, it's supposed to transition into something better, right? I, I'm putting better in there because that's the way I see it. That's not necessarily the way it was designed to be, but uh, you know, if you, if you manage prairies, you see this all the time, right? There's always shrubs and trees that are trying to invade our prairies, and we work against those with disturbance. But it's a it's a weird place to be for a prairie because it makes prairies seem like they're this intermediate community. And then on the other hand, you hear people talk about climax prairies because that's sort of the end point of where we want them to be. It's like the pinnacle of what we want. That also makes me uncomfortable, honestly, because I don't I don't see prairies as a climax community um, for a lot of reasons. But the main, the main point I want to make here is I don't think ecological, ecological, ecological succession in this linear fashion does a very good job of describing what we want for resilience in prairies. Um, again, it's too linear and, and nature is just more complex than that. So the term that, that we'll talk about today and that you'll, if you haven't heard of it before by ecological resilience name, you've probably heard about something like multiple stable states or stability regimes or state and transition models. All of those things are tied up within this whole bigger picture of ecological resilience. And it's different than engineering resilience. So engineering resilience, if you have a, a pendulum or a bridge and you disturb that, engineering resilience is like, what does it take to get back to exactly where we started? You know, the bridge has to, has to flex and then come back. The pendulum moves and then comes back. That's engineering resilience. But it doesn't make a lot of sense with ecological systems. If you have a prairie and you disturb that prairie, it doesn't necessarily come back to exactly where it was. It doesn't look exactly the same afterwards because it's more complex than that. There are too many things that can happen. So with ecological resilience, I think it's easier to think about rather than a ball on a string, it's, it's more like a ball within a bowl. And that bowl is the range of stability or the stability regime or the stability domain within that prairie, within which that prairie exists as itself. So if you think about it that way, when you have a disturbance, fire, grazing, drought, it pushes that ball around within the bowl and it moves around, but as long as it stays within the bowl, it's still, it's, it's still a prairie. It still has its, its basic functions. It's providing the habitat and the processes that all the species need and all those networks are still connected together as an ident as it has an, its own identity as a prairie. But if we push it too far with something like uh, you know, a plow, uh, it leaves that stability regime, it leaves the bowl, and it goes to something else and becomes, it, it, it enters a new stability regime where it could be very resilient in its new, in its new form, but it's not the prairie that it was before. And once you do that, once you move over that threshold, it's really good, hard to go backwards. And we'll talk about that here in a second. So a couple of examples of thresholds, um, you know, if, if you turn a, a prairie into a soybean field, you've, you've definitely crossed that threshold. And we could stop farming this field and let it go back, but it's not going to go back to the same prairie it was before. That's just not how ecological succession works um, and or resilience. Another threshold could be woody encroachment in a prairie, right? If you let too many trees grow up for a while, you have a prairie with trees, but eventually you have a forest with some, with some open grassland and left in it. And that's a very, a forest with some grass is very different than a prairie with some trees, different species, different processes, everything is different. And at some point, it's really difficult to just go back. If we go into an area like this and you just cut those trees down, you're not gonna get the same prairie that you had before if it's gone far enough down that road. And then where it gets really tricky is when you talk about degradation of prairies, where you just have a prairie that, for example, has a lot of years of overgrazing or some herbicide use in, in addition to that. And you start losing enough species that the community is so different that it doesn't really have the same productivity or the same functionality that it had before. And even though it looks like a prairie, it's not, it, it doesn't look like a bean field or, a, or a, a woodland, it may not function in the same way and be the same kind of prairie. And because of that, 
I would argue that a lot of these sites like that have, have entered that new stable state. They're in a different bowl than they were before. And I say that partly because as a land manager, I've tried to work with sites like this and move them to back, back to where I think they really should be in terms of species diversity, as an example. And it's just not happening uh, without a lot of work, you know, without adding seeds and doing a lot of work where we're putting a lot of energy into it and trying to increase that species diversity. And even there, we're not getting back to the same community that was before the degradation happened. So I think there is a, a threshold there that we cross to. So as land managers, that's our job. Our job is to keep the ball in the bowl. It doesn't mean that we don't disturb it. We do have to disturb it. We have to do a lot of disturbance to keep it healthy and productive, but we also have to be careful that it doesn't get pushed so far that it gets pushed out of the bowl. And we could talk a lot about the bowl here and I don't wanna spend time doing that, but you know, ideas like, should we make the bowl bigger, steeper walled, broader, how, how are the ways that we affect that bowl to keep it keep the ball from coming out of it as easily? And a lot of those things we'll talk about later in a different in a different way. The last thing I wanted to say on this though is that don't think about it in terms of just a bowl and then another bowl. It's more like an, an egg carton with a lot of different places that ball could go, right? So depending on the disturbance of what happens, that ball could move in a lot of different directions and it could become a lot of different things. It's again, it's not a linear system in any way. Okay. Wes, are there anything anything in the chat that we should address real quick or we can move on and hit them later? Got a couple of comments. Meredith Cornett says these photos are incredible. And uh, Mary Beth Becker-Loth says, thanks for the alternative model. Perfect. Thanks, Meredith. Good to hear from you. Okay. So let's talk about how to do this then. If we want to be land managers or just in, in conservation in general, there's kind of three things that I think of when I think about how to build and maintain resilience. The first is species diversity, and we've already talked about that, right? Having multiple roles that are redundant, that are overlapping, uh, can really build resilience in a system. So that's important. To have that, though, you also have to have habitat. And so the size of a habitat and also redundancy here. So the habitat, so if you look at this prairie with, with some, some shaded areas from the trees, hills with different slopes and aspects, and there are replications of that. There are multiple trees, there are multiple hills, there are multiple north-facing slopes on those hills. The size of that habitat and the, and the redundancy of the, the smaller habitats within that is really important in terms of maintaining and building resilience. And then very closely related is this idea of habitat connectivity, right? So large blocks of habitat are ideal, that's great. If we can't have that, at least building some kind of connectivity between habitat patches can also help with, with resilience. So the strategies that we use to promote resilience are really not surprising. They're the same things that we, you know, they're kind of the no brainer things we do for conservation anyway. Protect the habitat that we have left, right? Let's not, let's not plow up any more prairies. Um, restore habitat where we can. And I'm gonna talk about that here in, in more detail, but you know, we're trying to enlarge and reconnect those areas. We're trying to influence that habitat size and connectivity we talked about. And when we do that, species diversity is important. And then management. And again, we'll talk about this too. So I'm not gonna talk more about protection today because that's a whole different thing we could talk about, but I will talk about restoration and management. And with management, it's about maintaining that diversity and managing for the habitat needs that the diversity needs. So let's start with restoration. Habitat loss and fragmentation is, you know, maybe the biggest uh, threat to prairies. Um, climate change is right up there too, but and they're connected. But if you have an area that's large and connected like this, a, a large intact grassland, and then you split it up into little pieces, whether that's with farming or something else, there's a lot of stress that immediately comes to the species and, and the communities living in those little prairies. And so when I talk about restoration, I'm not talking about turning it back to this again, because that's not reasonable in today's world, right? We need cropland, for example, uh, for a lot of reasons. And, and the productive soils underneath former prairies are really good places to do farming if we do it well. But we have this fragmented landscape. What I would say is when we think about restoration, we need to think about something like this, where we're just doing incremental restoration. We're trying to find ways to make those small isolated remnants a little bit more viable. And we can do that in a couple of ways. We can make little remnants bigger, and by making them larger, we're increasing resilience, we're giving species more habitat, uh, we're allowing populations of those species to be larger, which makes them harder to get rid of uh, if something ha happens in part of that prairie. If you have a disease, for example, that comes through or a predation, a predation event, uh, 
um, reducing the amount of edge is really important. A lot, of, a lot of species in prairies don't like to live near the edges because that's where predators are, that's where invasive species come in, there's different microclimates there. And so making those areas bigger and eliminating those edges in the middle um, gives you a lot more core interior area, which is important for some species. And then it also can be a way to reconnect isolated pieces together, right? So you can reconnect genetic pathways, you can reconnect travel pathways or migratory pathways for species that are important. Uh, and do you just, again, you give, it allows those populations of individual species to be more viable because if they disappear in one place, there's a pathway for recolonization from someplace else. And that reconnection doesn't have to always be physically uh, adjacent. Sometimes just having stepping stones, having other prairies nearby is enough for species that are, that are mobile. And when I'm talking about restoration of prairies, I'm, there's, there's sort of two ways you could think about that. And the first one would be thinking about restoring a, an old building, uh, Ford's Theater, as example, in Washington, D.C., where, where Abraham Lincoln was, was shot. It was really cool to take our family there and see what that theater looked like that day. But that theater has burned almost completely, except for the outside shell, was turned into an office building, and then eventually was restored back to what it looked like on the night that Abraham Lincoln was shot. So that kind of restoration project is an educational restoration project, and the results are judged by whether it looks the same as it did before. And you wanna to try to use the same materials and do it in exactly the same way, rebuild, and you have a very defined product that you're trying to get to. That's not really what we wanna do with prairie restoration or, or any ecological restoration. I would say that process is much more like building a, rebuilding a city after a disaster. So you think about uh, New Orleans or uh, places after Hurricane Sandy on the East Coast. Those cities didn't care at that point uh, or the people in those cities didn't care so much about whether the city looked exactly like it did before the storm. What they really needed was they needed the services to be re, re or put back in, in place. They needed transportation and communication and law enforcement and, and food and all those sorts of things. They needed to access to all those things. And so what it looked like was a lot less important than the functionality. And that's where I think it, it fits better with the way we should think about ecological restoration. The purpose is to maintain a healthy community uh, whether it's the healthy community of people in a city or healthy communities of animals and plants and other things in a, in a prairie. And then if you're gonna do that, the diversity again is really important because providing those services, we need to do that in a way that they're, they're redundant and resilient. So when I talk about restoration, then what I'm talking about is this idea of enlarging and reconnecting habitat areas to, to increase resilience, right? So here's an example of what we've done with that on the Platte River in Nebraska with the Nature Conservancy. Um, we took these, these green hatched areas and the, the solid green areas were crop field that we put back into prairie habitat as a way to reconnect those areas together. And we've done a little bit of, you know, defragmenting of the landscape is, is the, the, the whole idea here. And we did, when we did those restorations from crop field to prairie, we used seed mixes of between 150 and 200 plant species with the idea that we wanted as much diversity as we could get. Uh, we harvested those uh, those seeds ourselves from local areas. And then overall, we've been able to find about 254 plant species across those different restorations. And that's actually old, that's like 2006 data. So it's probably better than that, but it gives you a feel for the species are showing up. But that's one way to measure success is that, you know, the, what we put in there shows up. Uh, we've, we've tried to figure out how else can we measure whether we've been successful with that restoration. So one for sure is that that plant diversity that we established initially has to be able to be maintained over time. If it's not, it's, it's not a resilient system. So I don't wanna spend time on this, but I'll just show you a couple of graphs to show you that we're doing that. Um, this is a floristic quality graph, which is like species diversity with some qualitative things thrown in. Um, but overall, the pattern here, if you look at it, we had a little dip in 2013 after that 2012 drought, and then it recovered. And so our, our species richness, our, our floristic quality at a small scale is really maintaining itself over time, which I think is a good, a good sign. We also have lots of data on individual species over that same period across a lot of sites showing that they're also you know, stable, increasing. We're not seeing any species that are going away, um, which is promising. <clears throat> and I think those two things combined are a good sign of ecological resilience. But another thing we wanted to look at was if, if we're really rebuilding the landscape or we're defragmenting the landscape, we want the animals that were in those little isolated fragments 
to be able to reconnect with each other uh, across the landscape. So they have to be moving through and into the habitat that we made or this doesn't work. So we've started on that process. We've looked at small mammals, we've looked at ants, grasshoppers and bees and basically just did work to see are the species that are in the, the old remnant prairies, the old fragmented remnant prairies that were never plowed, are those same species now in the restored habitats? And by and large, the answer is yes. Um, usually when we, when we see differences between the remnants and restored, there are species that are in one but not the other, but sometimes that's species that are in the remnant only, but sometimes it's species that are in the restored area only, and a lot of times I think that's a sample size issue. So we're still pushing on this idea but we think this is an important way to measure, um, but it's just a first step. There's still a lot more we wanna do. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we're at the stage now where we're trying to figure out what those other measures could be. You know, what else could we reasonably measure to see whether this restoration process, process is actually building resilience and, and sort of defragmenting that landscape. But let's switch gears and talk about prairie management now. And when I talk about prairie management, you know, fire, grazing, and invasive species management are the, the three things that we focus on mostly out here. I'm only gonna talk about the first two of those today because invasive species control is its own, its own rabbit hole. I'll mention it, but, and the framework that I'm gonna start with here is this idea that if we want resilience, we have to have species diversity, which we talked about. And in order to support species diversity, we need to have heterogeneous habitat. And the reason for that is that there are a lot of different types of habitat structure, even in a prairie, right? You can have prairies that are very tall and dense, but you can also have prairies that are very short and sparse. And then there's things in the middle, like a prairie with short grass, but tall wildflowers, um, or a prairie that has very patchy density of where there's some areas that are very tall and dense and some that are short that are intermixed with each other. And that short grass, tall forbs I mentioned earlier, uh, is a result of doing something that influences the grass, the, the energy or the vigor of those grasses, so that they're, they're either being taken down or they're weakened in a way that the wildflowers get a chance to grow. And I don't know any way to produce that other than to use cattle or some kind of livestock. Um, and so we use cattle as a management tool. We use, we use them as, as sort of habitat artists that, that help us create the habitat structure that we want in these prairies to support diversity and resilience, which I'll talk about. So again, look at that, look at that structure. I mean, I guess if you were really good with a weed whacker, maybe you could create that kind of habitat structure, but I don't think you're gonna be able to do it on the 3000 acres scale that we're, that we're managing here, right? So that, those grazing animals, whether it's cattle or bison or, or something else, um, well, I shouldn't say something else, horses maybe, sheep and goats don't work very well because sheep and goats tend to be for eaters, right? So they're gonna eat the wildflowers that we're trying to encourage with this strategy uh, because those forbs, those wildflowers are the, is where most of the diversity lies. And grasses tend to be the competitor against that diversity. So if we have a really strong grass community, a lot of the times that suppresses the rest of the diversity of the community. And something like a cow or a bison or a horse that selectively feeds on grasses primarily can be really helpful. So you might ask yourself or you might ask me, well, okay, but, why is it important to have all that different types of habitat structure? Well, it's important because there are species that use each one, right? So with, within the bird community, upland sandpipers really are focused on these large areas of short vegetation where Henslow sparrows need fairly large areas, but they really need tall and dense vegetation. And they're even okay with a little bit of shrub cover. So those are, those are two species that are not gonna live in the same spot, right? Because they have very, very different habitat needs. And that exists within the insect community. You've got some grasshoppers that like to be out in open spare and bare ground where others are really built to be in more dense vegetation. Um, and then plants too, right? There are plants like curly cup gumweed, which is a really cool little pollinator friendly plant, but it's an annual and it only shows up if the grasses around it are really knocked back out of the way because it can't compete with those big strong grasses like big blue stem, which is on the opposite end where it does very well uh, in an area that's sort of stagnant and rank and hasn't had much for fire or grazing lately. Big blue stem likes that just fine. So again, you might ask, what if we want all those species at the same time in the same prairie? Well, let me tell you about the shifting mosaic of habitat patches. This is an approach that um, a lot of us use in prairie management. It's, uh, if you've heard about patch burn grazing, patch burn grazing is one example of a way to, sh to create a shifting mosaic of habitats, but it's not the only one. 
uh, there are a lot of ways to do this. And basically the objective is to have a prairie that has different habitat types in different places so that we can accommodate all those species that have needs. And what you do is you represent those habitat types across that site. But then if these are the different habitat types as an illustration here, year to year, you shift the location of each of those. So they're not always in the same place. And that's important for a few different reasons. It's important if you're a plant because if you're a plant and you like the, the green area there, um, you might grow really well because the grasses are being pushed back out of the way, right? Maybe you're curly cup gumweed. But there are other species that are, that are trying to thrive there that are not doing well. And if that green area stays in the same place all year and, and or over a long period of time and that, that site gets grazed every single year, the habitat conditions are probably pretty good for a lot of different species of, of animals, but the plants are really gonna suffer because there are species that are always gonna be managed against. And so shifting those areas around means that that, that, that curly cup gumweed might have a couple of tough years when the grasses come back, but it, it can hold on in the system until the, the conditions that it really wants comes back around. So plants can survive in the shifting mosaic pretty well. And then even for animals, you know, if you have the same habitat type in the same place year after year after year, you tend to have issues with things like disease buildup or predators become really good at, at adapting to where those, those prey species are gonna be located. There's all kinds of problems that are similar to the things that affect uh, the reason that we have crop rotation or in, in your garden or in a crop in a farm field, right? Using the same crop in the same place for a lot of, a lot of years in a row has issues. So the same thing applies here. So that's the shifting part of the mosaic. So on the ground, it might look like this. This is actually my family prairie. Um, you know, this is, which is a degraded site that we're trying to rehabilitate. But you can see the habitat on the left and right of this fence are really different. And when you scale that up, now we're on conservancy ground again. This is a site that is using a, we call it open gate uh, grazing rotation. And I won't go into that. You can look it up on my blog if you wanna learn more about it. It's a cool system that we're experimenting with, similar to patch burn grazing, but doesn't rely on fire. But the idea here is that we've got lots of different habitat types. So the bottom right, we've got short and intensively grazed. The, the bottom left is gonna get some grazing or had some grazing this year. The top right has not had grazing for several years. It's really tall and dense. And then you've got a, a site that's recovering from being intensively grazed the previous year. And each year we start grazing in a different place, but we're also not restricting the cattle into that one pasture for the entire, the whole season. Basically the open gate system is you start them in pasture one, you open the gate to pasture two sometime in the middle of the season, but you leave the gate open and you allow those, those animals to flow back and forth. And then you just open up another gate later and you can do that as many times as you want. The point is the habitat structure here. And so part of what makes that work is this idea of disturbance and recovery. So this is a site that was burned in the spring of 2016. It had cattle on it all season long. They grazed it really, really hard. And they did that because it was, this is in a patch burn system where the unburned area was right next door. There was nothing that kept the cows out of there. They could go in and feed there too. But they spent most of their time in the burned area because that's where the best grass was. And they grazed that grass hard enough that in this photo in July, it was a hot, dry summer. And a lot of those grasses had basically gone dormant by late July. So they're still alive, but they're dormant and they're not providing habitat structure. They're trying to you know, save themselves for next year. Here's the same site a year later. So we went from bare soil almost um, and really weak grasses to a recovery phase. And in this recovery phase, this is a, again, late July. Look how tall those grasses are. Those, those are. those grasses, a lot of those are things like big blue stem and Indian grass that can grow five or six feet tall normally on our sites. This year, the tallest they got might've been 10 inches because they had a really hard year the year before. In the meantime, there's this release from competition for all the other species around them, like the rosin weed in the foreground, the, the bee balm, the monarda there, yarrow, um, prairie clovers, lead plant, all these other things that, that have a chance to respond to the lack of competition. And they really flourish for a year, in, in addition to a lot of weedier species, a lot of times uh, that are annuals like the curly cup gumweed again. And then just across the, the fire break, this is the same prairie, but this is the part that didn't get grazed hard. And you can see how much taller the grasses are, but it's still, you know, it's, it's a very different habitat structure and a very different level of sort of grass to, to wildflower dominance. All of them, all these are really good. 
they're just in different places. And then by starting that disturbance in a different place each year, we can, we can start that process of disturbance and recovery over and over and over. And the key is to allow enough recovery after that intense disturbance that everything has a chance to kind of get its footing again before the, disturb the next disturbance comes. And I just wanted to show this graph one last time. This is just, again, this is the same site that we just saw pictures of. And this is that, that mean floristic quality over time. So it's, it's maintaining the resilience of the plant community, even through that kind of disturbance and recovery phase. And then I wanna end with talking about small prairies because there are some challenges that come along with managing smaller sites where, for example, grazing may not be uh, all that helpful because it just doesn't make sense for a lot of reasons to put cattle in. And with small prairies, I have, I've kind of made this flow chart and it starts with this question of, can you make the prairie bigger? Because if you have a small isolated prairie, there are just so many challenges associated with that, that the, the long-term viability is, can, can be really hard to see. And if there's anything you can do with restoration to make that prairie just a little bit bigger or find ways to connect it to other nearby prairies, that solves a lot of problems. So if you can do that, do it and do anything you can to save that prairie by making it bigger. If you can't, okay, then let's move on to some other things. So one choice you have to make there is in that small prairie, do you have rare species that you feel like have to be the primary focus of your management? If you do, you might make the decision to, to just focus on those rare species, whether that's plants or insects or birds or whatever. The other option is let's manage this for as much biodiversity as we can for the resilience reasons we've talked about. If you go the rare species uh, route, that can be really challenging because those rare species might be relying on that resilient, diverse system around them. And if you manage the same way every year, for example, if you have a butterfly that doesn't like fire, right? You might say, okay, well, we're not gonna burn this prairie because this prairie has butterflies in it that don't like fire. But then if you don't burn, you start having issues with more shrub encroachment. And there's this whole sort of cascade of impacts that can happen from focusing too much on a rare species. So it's not that you can't do it, it's just very difficult. If you can manage for that diverse system and hope that the rare species of all kinds can be maintained within that, that's probably a better path, but there are also a lot of challenges with that. And a lot of those challenges are associated with how do you create that shifting mosaic on a small scale in a way that's gonna be good for all the species there because each of those species has a smaller area that they have to survive in now. So just a couple of quick ideas um, with small prairies. If you have access to fire, you know, you can, you can use fire in a lot of different ways. You can burn at different times a year. You can uh, burn at different types of intensity. Yesterday, the fire, or this week, the fires that we were doing, we had 17% relative humidity, which is very, very dry. And so it was a very complete burn in the areas that we burned, but we wanted that because we we're trying to reach some objectives with the cedar trees you see behind me here. Um, but you can burn on days with 50 or 60% humidity and you get a very patchy burn. It's just a very different type of intensity. And both of those can be helpful. Uh, you can do false burns, spring burns, summer burns, and you could have a site where you have a couple of different burns within the same year in different places that are providing something different. The most important thing with fire on small sites though is to leave refuges. You don't wanna burn the entire, say a 40 acre prairie or a 20 acre prairie. If you burn that entire 20 acre prairie and there's no other prairie nearby, anything that didn't survive that fire is now gone from your site. And a lot of those species have no way to get back. And so that's an extinction event when you burn an entire site. So that's a really big deal to leave, you know, a third or a half of a site unburned if you can. Uh, and not always, that's not always logistically easy to do, but that's something that's really important to consider. And then haying and mowing tend to be also, you know, good things that you can do to create habitat structure and change disturbance conditions. And again, leaving refuges is really important. Don't hay the whole site if you can help it. Um, because you're, you're drastically changing the habitat. Uh, think about bees, right? Think about those bees that have the little nest in the ground and that solitary single mom bee has to go out and find nectar and pollen every day. Well, she's in the middle of a prairie and all of a sudden that prairie becomes hayed. All those flowers are gone, she's gone. She, the, that nest fails instantly because there's no place for her to go. So leaving refuges is helpful for a lot of things. And then again, being, being creative, you can, you can vary the timing of mowing. You could mow some of it early and some of it later. You could mow some of it high and some of it low. Uh, there's no rule that says you have to make squares when you, when you hay a, a prairie or mow a patch of prairie. You could take a tractor and a mower and just start making curly cue patterns throughout the prairie and create a heterogeneity of structure. There's all these things that you can do if you think about it creatively. 
And then the last thing is man in a small prairie, anybody who knows uh, management, management of small prairies know it's really tough to control invasives because they're just coming in from everywhere and you're so close to the edge anywhere you are in that prairie that they always have access to it. And so, uh, you know, hats off to any, everybody who manages small prairies. That's a tough job. So wrapping up, uh, ecological resilience, big strategies, protection, restoration, management, uh, which is what we've talked about. And I'll leave it there and we can ask questions now. So thank you for paying attention through all of that. That was a long, long talk. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of the questions from the chat. If anybody would like to unmute and uh, ask a question between them, feel uh, free to do that. The first question comes from Julia. Uh, she asks, what are some of the biggest unanswered questions that would help you slash TNC design more resilient restorations and effective management practices? Uh, let's see. Uh, you know, one, and Mer Meredith is on the, on the phone, the Conservancy in Minnesota and the Dakotas is actually doing some really cool stuff with genetics, trying to figure out, you know, with climate change, should we be sticking to this idea of using local seed? Um, or should we be trying to think about using seed from other places to give us a more diverse genetic base in those new sites so that they're better, maybe better adapted to the future climate rather than the climate of the past? Um, that there's just a lot of questions there. We don't have an answer. Uh, it's something we need to experiment with and that's happening a little bit. Well, more than a little bit, but it's happening at least now uh, in the Minnesota Dakotas area. So that's one big question. Um, you know, we're trying to figure out right now with some of the, the grazing management, and this is sort of related to your question, but you know, when we do that very intense grazing and we allow re recovery, we know that the plant species recover uh, we feel pretty good that the insects and all those other things are recovering. We know a lot less about the soil and what happens there. We know that when we have that sort of intensive grazing, it does affect the processes within the soil. And we, we've measured that. We're actually in the middle of an experiment right now doing that with clipping. And we can see a drastic change in soil respiration and activity like that. What we don't know is what's the long-term average of that. So if you compare this sort of intense grazing, long recovery to something where you have light grazing every year, after 20 or 30 years, is there, a, is there an actual difference in the soil function, soil organic matter production, uh, all those sorts of things below ground? We, I, we don't know the answer to that yet. And that's a huge question we need to figure out. So those are a couple of examples. Thanks, and yeah, thanks for a great talk. It's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, Shavona asks, uh, from your experience, is there a minimum threshold for patch size slash shape and landscape configuration that allows for natural recolonization of prairie plants? See, there's another example of those questions that we have to answer. Um, that's something I think a lot about and I don't know because I could make an argument, for example, so that what we do know about is we know things like birds, right? We have pretty good data on grasshopper sparrows and meadow larks in terms of the patch size that they need. What we know less about are things like um, leafhoppers or bees or even plant species, because I can make an argument that a plant species might need a much larger patch uh, to have a, you know, a viable population of interactions and genetics than, than a bird species might, but I just don't know. So I guess I try to think about, you know, historically, you probably had some fairly large burns happening uh, in, you know, in, in like in the Nebraska sand hills where we have 12 million acres. You can imagine a five or 10 or 20 or 50,000 acre burn happening pretty easily in a landscape like that. Um, and, but that probably had some really serious consequences to anything that was inside that burn area and had, was surrounded by you know, miles and miles and miles of black. But the system was large enough and intact enough that it could, it could, it could absorb those sort of impacts to individual uh, animals or plants. We don't have that, that, that opportunity to absorb that kind of thing today. So, it's a really important question because there's a big difference between a 10 or like a, a thousand acre prairie where you do 300 acre burn graze patches versus a thousand acre prairie where maybe you do, you know, five much smaller burn patches uh, and scatter them around so that the species have those different options available. And I just, I don't know how to, how to measure that at this point, but if somebody wants to figure that out, please let me know. Thank you. Right. 
yeah. a couple of uh, questions about small prairies here. I'll just mm -hmm. list them off since they're related. One is how small is a small prairie? Um, and what is there value in restoring uh, small areas such as one third of an acre, uh, along with when do you start worrying about your prairie as an ecological sink when in regards to small prairies? Oh, excellent questions, all of them. Okay, don't let me forget these. Let me start and see. A small prairie to me uh, is going to be something that is, I don't know, I mean, 20 or 30 acres is, I would say is small. Um, some people might argue that that's pretty big, depends on where you're from. And I'm, I'm fine with that, you know, but when you get down to, you know, two to three to four to five acres, I think that's definitely a small prairie. And a lot of it is, to me, it's oriented around your management options, right? If, you've, if you're limited in the ability to graze a site, for example, or if, if burning a site becomes really difficult without burning all of it, uh, you're dealing with a small prairie. Anything that, that hinders your ability to do the management that you want. So then the second question was, is there value to those little tiny prairies, like a third of an acre? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, but I think it's important to, to consider what your objectives are that, that are reasonable, right? So you're not gonna get prairie chickens on a third of an acre. So don't, don't manage for prairie chickens. That's an obvious thing. But even things like, um, you know, populations of insects are gonna have a hard time. Some species of insects might have a really hard time with a viable population in a third of an acre, no matter how well you manage that site. It's, it may be way too small for some things that, and it may be surprising that, you know, which species don't do well in that site, which doesn't mean that they're not valuable. It just means you have to, to be reasonable in your expectations and then decide like, what is my real objective for this? And, and you might decide that your objective is going to be something like, I want this third of an acre to be attractive aesthetically because I want people to see it and build a connection with prairies that will influence their, you know, supportive conservation of prairies overall. That's a really important objective that a third of an acre prairie could, could help us achieve. Or it might also be a site where like, like, okay, we know that we may not have viable populations of a lot of insects during the year, but boy, during insect migration period in the fall, when monarchs are moving through and dragonflies are moving through and all these other butterflies and moths and, and large milkweed bugs and all these species that we don't, didn't even know migrated until recently, when they're moving through, maybe the value of this third of an acre is it's a stepping stone along their path. And so we wanna manage for something like a lot of flower, showy flowers in the fall for migrating pollinators. Um, that, that could be another objective. So the key is to think about like, what could this prairie contribute even knowing that the viability of a lot of species may not be great. Okay, those are the first two. What was the third one again? Uh, in regards to the small prairies, when do you start worrying about your prairie as an ecological sink? Yeah, always. Um, the question is, what can you do about it? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, so if, if probably everybody knows what an ecological sink is, right? But the, the risk here is that you don't want to create something that's going to attract a species that's just going to come there and die. Um, and that is that, I mean, that's absolutely a risk. And I don't know how small a site has to be before that becomes a problem because that's different for every species. I really think the key there is, um, I, I would hate to, to say that any small area of habitat is bad, but if there are species where you feel like you've got pretty good evidence that you are drawing them in only to die, and if it's a species that's at risk, maybe that affects the way you manage, right? Maybe you manage in a way that's not as attractive to those species, but gosh, that gets you down such a rabbit hole. I, I would prefer to focus on, uh, you know, it's not that prairie's fault that that species is at risk enough that it's a sink. So what can you do with that prairie to create the best habitat you can for the most species is I, I think what I would still focus on. But it's, it's, it's a great point to think about. That's all the questions we have in the chat. Does anybody, would, it, would anybody feel comfortable unmuting and asking a question they have? Hey, this is Meredith Cornett. I'll ask a question. Meredith. Hi, Chris. Boy, this uh, really um, brought some color into our afternoon. Thank you so much. I just love <laughs> looking at your photos and hearing your musings. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I wondered if we could circle back to 
climate change and um, and and you mentioned some of the work we're doing in Minnesota, but I'm just wondering specifically, it's been a while since we've talked about this, how does, um, how does prairie management in the climate change era uh, look different in Nebraska? Um, you know, the short answer is I'm not sure it does, honestly, that in, in terms of individual site management, because we've been focused for a while on managing for heterogeneity and diversity, which I still think is the, the biggest key to making, you know, resilient prairies from a climate change standpoint. We started out doing it, not thinking about climate change so much, but just trying to think about viability of those communities and, and this, this sort of vague idea that I had of, about resilience 25 years ago. Um, but then as we've learned more and more, it seems like what we were doing was important for other reasons as well. So uh, I think we, got, we stumbled luckily into a strategy that I think also works for, for climate change, but that's at a site basis, right? So thinking larger, I think is where we're, we're, we're changing a little bit the way we're, we're envisioning this and trying to think outside of the individual prairie or the individual management unit or pasture or whatever. Um, and, and as you know, I mean, that's where the Conservancy and a lot of other groups are trying to figure out how do we, how do we build that connectivity and the habitat size at a much larger scale to, you know, facilitate species colonization and migratory patterns and, and larger metapopulations outside of that individual site. So I, I think that's the change that I've had. I don't know that, I don't know that climate change has influenced our, our on-site management all that much. That's a great distinction. Thank you. Absolutely. It looks like we're out of time. Uh, Chris did mention before we started that uh, he would be open to uh, email questions from anybody in the audience that would like to reach out to him. Um, we can have his email posted on the Conservation Science Seminar website where you can also find this uh, a recording of the seminar uh, there. So thank you everybody for attending and thank you Chris for uh, traveling all the way to Minnesota via Zoom to join us. Great to talk to you everybody.